It's Thursday, January 16th. My name's Juan Brown. You're watching the Blanco Lirio channel. We just had a major frontal passage pass through the Blanco Lirio Global Headquarters, dumping over five inches of snow in just three hours. Now, as an air crew member, there's only one objective you want to really achieve on each flight, and that is to stay out of the national news on every flight, on every leg of every flight. And there's no faster way to go from hero to zero in an emergency return than to dump fuel on an excessively low altitude all over the population of a major city. So let's go into the fuel jettison procedures on the Boeing 777 aircraft. Talk about some overweight landing con considerations. Let's retire to the hangar where it's a little drier. We'll start with the facts as we know them so far. This is from Simon Radecki's website, the Aviation Herald, highly recommend it. Incident Delta 777 200 at LA on January 14, 2020. Engine compressor stalls, <laughs> liquid rains onto school. A Delta Airlines Boeing 777-200 registration, November 860 Delta Alpha, performing flight as Delta 89 Heavy from LA to Shanghai, with 181 people on board, was climbing out of LA's runway 24 left when the crew stopped the climb at 8,000 feet, reporting a right-hand engine, these are the Rolls-Royce, the Trent 892 engines on the 777-200, as opposed to the GE engines on the 300 series of 777 compressor stalls and they needed to return to Los Angeles. The crew subsequently advised that they had brought the engine back under control, just needed to slow down and requested to land on runway 25 right. Remember on compressor stalls you need to retard the throttle on the affected engine until the engine stops stalling or stops banging and then you can leave the engine at that power setting or if you got to come all the way back to idle and the engine is still compressor stalling you need to shut that engine down in this case it sounds like they got the engine under control by reducing the throttle on the affected engine regardless of whether or not the engine recovers from the compressor stall you still got to return and land and have that engine inspected check out agent jz's youtube channel for a Excellent description of engine compressor stalls in jet engines. The aircraft was vectored for an ILS approach to runway 25 right. Emergency services went into their standby position. The crew did not request fuel dump. The aircraft landed safely on 25 right about 25 minutes after departure. The aircraft vacated the runway. In other words, they didn't blow the fuse plugs and they were able to taxi under their own power off of the runway. More on that later. The Los Angeles Fire Department re result, reported that as a result of the emergency landing, they needed to respond to the Park Avenue Elementary School located about 10 nautical miles short of the runway with more than 70 firefighters. They reported of some liquid raining down onto the school playground where two classes were outdoors. The liquid smelled like jet fuel. The firefighters checked 17 children and nine adults. None needed to be taken to a hospital. The airline later reported that the aircraft performed an emergency fuel dump to reduce landing weight. So today let's have a general discussion on dumping of fuel or fuel jettisoning procedures on these heavy aircraft, some of the considerations that you need to take into the account, some of the misconceptions that are out there, and let's see if we can get to the bottom of this. Now, I often fly as the third pilot on a 777 crew out of Los Angeles for a major airline, and one of the, one of the main things we do uh, before we depart each flight is we have a huddle or a briefing as to how we're going to handle contingencies for each takeoff on each leg of each flight. One of the things we discuss in this briefing is what are we going to do if we lose an engine on takeoff? And one of the jobs as the third pilot, one of my jobs is to look up the data and see how much runway will we need to land on if we lose an engine at our current weight here on departure. Will we need to dump fuel to make our runway landing distance? And on the 767-200ER, even at max gross weight, nearly 660,000 pounds, on a dry runway return, you can land over your maximum landing weight. This is another subject we'll talk about in a second. You can land up to your maximum gross weight or maximum takeoff weight 
and use only about 6,000 feet of runway on one engine. The runway at Los Angeles, the longest runway, 25 right, is over 12,000 feet long. Now this, of course, needs to take into other considerations if in the event there's weather involved, if the runway condition reading or if the runway is wet or slippery or icy, not likely at Los Angeles, these numbers vary considerably. So landing distance, returning for a landing in the amount of runway available is one of your primary considerations in the event of an engine failure on takeoff and for the consideration of fuel dumping or fuel jettisoning jettisoning. One of the most common misconceptions, and this again was promulgated by the media yesterday, is that pilots are required to dump fuel before they can land so that they get below their maximum landing weight certified for the aircraft. And this is not true, especially in the case of the Boeing 777 and the Boeing 767 aircraft. There's a bit of ancestor warship from previous designs like the MD-11 aircraft and the 747 where there was a greater emphasis on getting below maximum landing weight before you land in the event of an emergency. But the Boeing 777 series of aircraft has enough safety margins built into it where both conditions are a safe condition, either A, landing over your maximum landing weight, or B, jettisoning, jettisoning fuel if you do the procedure correctly and have enough altitude for the fuel to properly disperse. And that altitude is generally six to 10,000 feet while jettisoning fuel to allow the fuel to properly atomize so that it's completely evaporated before it hits the ground. It appears that this crew, for some reason, continued to have fuel jettisoning all the way down to about 2,500 feet, well below the recommended minimum altitude. Why, we don't know. We won't know until there's an investigation about all this. But here's a couple of ideas. Because some early aircraft did have an emphasis on landing below maximum landing weight, there was an emphasis on jettisoning fuel before landing in the event of an emergency return. Some of this has carried over to the Boeing 777 aircraft. So some of these crews are old enough to carry some of this ancestor warship, as we call it, into the cockpit of the Boeing 777 when they really need to sit down and take a good close look at the data from Boeing regarding overweight landings. If you do an overweight landing in the Boeing 777, it will require a heavyweight landing check after landing. That's not a big deal. You're returning to the airport anyways for an emergency. The aircraft is going to be have to be repaired for whatever emergency it was that you returned for. And the overweight landing initial phase one part of the overweight checklist can be done in about two to four hours. It's simply a visual inspection of the exterior of the aircraft looking for damage. If there are signs of damage to the aircraft from an overweight landing, then there'll be an additional inspection to start popping panels and looking for damage inside the airframe of the aircraft. And this inspection needs to be done regardless of how smooth you landed the aircraft. A hard landing is a separate maintenance function. That's a separate checklist. Ask me how I know. I'll post a link to all this information in the comment section below. Regarding overheating the brakes uh, on the aircraft upon landing. The brake system on these aircraft are designed for the worst case scenario, which is a rejected takeoff at max gross weight. A rejected takeoff at max gross weight or max takeoff weight is far more damaging to the wheels and brakes of the aircraft than is a heavy weight landing or a landing near maximum takeoff weight. What the tires, wheels, and brakes are designed to do is take that aircraft up to V1 takeoff decision speed at maximum takeoff weight, reject the takeoff, apply RTO or rejected takeoff, maximum braking, and get the aircraft stopped and then absorb that energy. The 
tires, wheels, and brakes, well, the tires have what's called fuse plugs built into them. That's a, a plug with a solder-filled component to it. So when the temperature of the tires exceeds about 400 degrees Fahrenheit, I think it is, and this is from heat coming off of the brakes, the tires will deflate in a controlled fashion so they don't overheat and explode, especially when you've got emergency responders responding to the aircraft. In the case of a heavyweight landing, especially at Los Angeles Airport, you've got over 12,000 feet of runway and a landing distance of, well, 6,000 feet in the worst case for the 767-200. These guys were coming in, in considerably lighter than, than that. Your biggest concern there is touching down gently, and the aircraft is designed to be able to handle an uh, overweight landing at a descent rate of about six, to see, six times three is uh, 18, six times six is 36, yeah. At about six feet per second, six feet per second times 60 seconds is about 360 feet per minute. 360 foot rate of descent maximum to touch down in the event of an overweight landing. Anything over three feet or six feet per second is a real kablammo landing, according to uh, Lieutenant Pete. And so the idea is to touch down gently on a heavyweight landing, which is what you're striving to do on any landing anyways. And of course, touch down in the proper touchdown zone so that you got plenty of room to roll out and not overheat the brakes. Damn! Now let's talk a little bit about fuel systems in the 777 and fuel management in general. The fuel tanks in the 777, there are three of them, two main wing tanks and one center tank located in the fuselage, and we've discussed this before in other videos. The 767-200 has the majority, the most of its fuel located here in the center tank, and that fuel needs to be burned first to minimize the amount of bending moment you're putting on the wings. You want to burn that center fuel first, keep the main fuel in the wing tanks, burn that last so as to minimize this. So each of the fuel tanks has two fuel boost pumps in it. The two boost pumps in the center tank are also your fuel jettison boost pumps on the 777. The two boost pumps that are in the center tank of the 777 also put out more PSI, more pressure, than the main wing tanks. So when you go to take depart on the 777, you go ahead and turn on all the fuel boost pumps, all six of them, and the center tank will feed first so that you alleviate the weight from the center of the aircraft, your standard fuel management procedure. Here's a schematic view of the Boeing 777 fuel system showing all three tanks and all six fuel boost pumps. An interesting factoid, notice that the center fuel tank capacity in pounds exceeds the max gross takeoff weight of a Boeing 737 aircraft. The fuel jettison system on the 777 is pretty straightforward. It has an arm switch and two guarded switches that open the fuel jettison nozzles and that will take that center tank fuel pump pressure and pump that fuel overboard. It will also add onto it, depending on which model of 777 we're talking about, it'll also add main fuel tank fuel pressure and jettison that as well. But the 777 will automatically set the fuel jettison system to turn off once you have reached your maximum landing weight fuel load. You can increase or decrease that amount on the panel but it will automatically turn off once you've reached your maximum landing weight. But that automatic process could take as long as 30, 35 minutes to complete. The fuel jettison nozzles are located well outboard on the wings between the flap and the ailerons, and you are allowed to dump fuel in the event of an engine fire. And once fuel jettisoning is done, you still need to turn off those fuel jettison switches anyway. So if you look at the numbers associated with this flight, the well, first off, if you're if you're going to max if you're going to jettison as much fuel as you possibly can 
going from a completely full fuel load down to your maximum landing weight, it's going to take you about 35 minutes to do that altogether as the fuel jettison rate is about 5,000 pounds per minute of fuel plus the fuel you're burning. So it can be a long process. This flight was on the ground within 20 minutes. There was no indication to ATC that these guys were going to dump fuel. In fact, he said, no, we're not going to dump fuel, and yet fuel is being dumped. So that begs the question, well, what happened there? Did somebody else, did the third pilot or maybe even a fourth pilot reach up there and hit the fuel dump switches? Or did somebody initiate the fuel dump process in the heat of battle and then forget to stop the fuel dump process on the way on in? We don't know, and we won't know until the FAA reviews the cockpit voice recorders, or at least just gets a, a, a uh, interview with the crew. Had ATC known that this crew was going to dump fuel, they would have worked with the crew to direct them to a place and an altitude to safely do the procedure. By the way, there's nothing in the 777 that turns the fuel jettison system off automatically based on altitude. You have to do it manually. So I hope this gives you a better understanding of the fuel dumping procedures in the Boeing 777 and I hope this opens up a wider discussion uh, when you go back to recurrent training and with your schoolhouse folks and with your instructors what are some of the considerations for fuel dumping should I when do I really need to be dumping fuel and what are my overweight landing considerations Thanks again for your support and especially thanks to you for your support on Patreon as oftentimes these videos on YouTube, they're no longer demonetizing them, they're calling them now eligible for limited ads only, whatever that means. So thank you for your support on Patreon. See you here.